All right, we're back. Um, we're gonna do a uh, polygamous model now. We closed down the one we were working on a minute ago. Right. <clears throat> so again, I'm gonna open this in the browser. Um, this it looks works a little bit better over here. And. Open our sample file with the polygamous data. Alright, now again something went wrong loading. Uh, again we don't have row names. Yeah, but in this one we do have a header, so that's good. It's better to have headers when you know what your items are about. Um, and we also have this frequency column, and that describes how many times this was observed. So each row does not correspond to one examinee, but it corresponds to one response pattern. And there were 71 examinees that uh, got both of these incorrect. So we need to do something extra here. We need to pick. Uh, or, or tell, indicate which column is the frequency column. So when we do that, uh, it no longer treats this as an item with 11 different outcomes, but it treats it as a frequency column. So frequency of pattern, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. pattern frequency, mm -hmm. right. Right now, these outcomes Oops. should need to be recoded as. Let me think here. If we have it somewhere in the right. So. Ah, out outcomes zero, one, two, and three should be reading to neither. Ah, right. Okay, so neither. So that that's like you got both of them wrong. Mm -hmm. um, neither. And then and one is three only. Three only. Uh, I think the items are like um, they're math questions and um, for for preschoolers. Mm -hmm. So uh, like one of them's about the number three and one of them's about the number four. That's why it's. I see three only, uh, only and then both correct. Okay, and then right. So three is both correct. Mm -hmm. Right, great. Um, now we need to go to the reorder tab, and um, these are all out of order. If you tried to fit the model without reordering these, it would be really confused because, um, yeah, we need to we need to put the all incorrect is the, the first thing, and the all correct is the last thing, and um, at a minimum to to get the the model to because it, the uh, Mm. The sum score, it uh, it gets a lot of information from the sum score. So if your sum scores don't make any sense, it's going to be hard to fit your model. That's right. Yeah. It's a very important detail. Um, let's see, neither of these items are reverse scored. Now let's go look at the parameters. So are we going to... I think we're going to... Okay, right. So this is like... Um, uh, a testlet. So these each, the match item actually consists of two items, and um, we're going to use the nominal, uh, the nominal response model uh, as as like a a way of doing testlets. Okay. So testlets, we use testlets because the uh, the the component items are not uh, conditionally independent, and but if we if we put them together into uh, a single item, then um, that that item can take care of the conditional dependence. So now the the setup of this is a little tricky. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, I think this page has everything. Okay. 
So let's see, gamma 3 is fixed to 0. So let's do that one first. Let's go to gamma 3. Oh wait, but we're doing... Hmm, is that... Oh yeah, both of them. Okay, gamma 3 is fixed to 0 for both of them. Karen, if you can check me on this. This is sure. so confusing. Sure. So we have equality constraints and... So gamma 2 has... Negative 1.2... The, well, yeah, the, those those sorry. numbers will be different right, because those are just random starting values. Um, but this this equality constraint we do need, so we do we need that one. So then we have the uh, we have that constraint here, and then for alpha two we have one. Uh, alpha two we have an equality constraint. Okay, and is there anything else? Let's see. Oh, these are. Change. Looks like you change the labels too. Change the labels. Math. Still has teacup. Oh, oh yeah. That's right. We don't want to. I think everything else a, is right. A teacup ability it's, doesn't make any sense. Let's fix that up. Okay. okay. Now we have math, and then the other thing. Oh, these. This is also uh, fixed to one. See uh, the. Um, Mm, these two parameters actually play the same role in the model, so if we don't fix one of them, then uh, it won't be identified. Mm. So we do have to fix it to one. All right. Mm -hmm. And and the alpha one is fixed to one, so that it's identified. But that and that's typically done on the first the first alpha as opposed to another alpha. It's it's rather arbitrary, but it tends to be the first one. Is that right? Um, okay, right. So that brings up a good point. Uh, the nominal model can have different parameterizations. So we're, we happen to be using a trend or a Fourier basis uh, parameterization uh, in this model, but you could also use uh, the what's called like an identity parameterization or the, uh, a partial credit uh, uh, parameterization, which, which is um, partial credit refers to the uh, master's um, partial credit model. Right. Uh, and of course the, the generalized partial credit model is just the only difference between those two is just you allow the slopes to vary as well. So. Um, So yeah. Yeah. Does that cover it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That's good. Great. So we'll just trend here. Um, let's see, we're not excluding any items. And mm -hmm. our summary. Here you can see the uh, we're using a trend parameterization in summary. And with items, we're using a nominal model. All right. So um, we're going to do the same procedure here. We're going to download the. Uh, the settings, just in case we need to come back with, come back to it and change something. Um, then we'll just skip to the analysis. And this time I'm going to pick the uh, this option to fit reference models, and that'll give us the uh, the Tucker Lewis index and the um, comparative fit index. So, okay. so. Mm -hmm. and since I changed something here, I want to refresh. Do I need to do that? I think refresh actually just uh, it just updates this preview here, so you don't really strictly you don't really need that. And then I'm going to download the our Markdown script. So let's go look at it in R Studio. So then you see, load it up in our studio and then just hit the knit HTML button. Oh, and of course it tells me I need to give a full path to the data file. Right. Let's try that again.
<clears throat> and here we saw the uh, the progress in the optimization again. And let's see, does that fit look right? So I don't remember. It should be matching. 67, 60, yeah, close, very 67. close. 67, so it's within pretty close. Mm -hmm. Right, and then uh, let's open this in the browser. Let's see. Percent. Right, so let's see, the first section here is just uh, loading the libraries. Let me load the data file. And um, this line is for the, uh, to adjust the frequency column to be numeric instead of ordinal ordinal data. Um, set up the factors. Make sure that we have all the columns we're expecting. Here we rename the or do the recoding on the outcomes. And set up set up the starting values. Mm -hmm. At least start to uh, and the item parameters are set up here. Um, so it sets up equality constraints and um, fixes some of the rows. Let's see. And we don't have a Bayesian prior in this model, so there isn't any code to set that up. We just have the item model and um, EM step and compute plan is the same as the dichotomous model. Right. Right, so the I wonder if we forgot something, because the fit is... I think that's what the fit this one. It's pretty close, yeah. Yeah, that's what this one is. It's one point off, though, and the condition number is mm. also different. Uh, the condition number I, I found is around 224, so the condition number is an indication of the stability of the solution. Um, if there's a lot of... Uh, let's see, if the... if it's lar if you have a large condition number, then you may be at a saddle point or um, like an unstable, your parameter estimates may be unstable. Um, 400 is not too bad. Um, I mean, uh, a condition number that's bad is like in the millions or uh, it depends on the model. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, okay, well, let's, let's see, maybe it's fine. There is some, because the starting values are random, so there is some variation here, and we haven't, uh, um, so every time you run this, we may get a slightly different solution because of starting values. Okay. So here's the sum score plot. Um, and then we have the, uh, the local dependence between item pairs, so there's only one pair of items, so we only have one uh, one cell in that chart, and it's not significant. Good. Um, our fit is also not significant, there's not significant misfit, so that's also good, quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's a little bit odd here in the the item response map is that the outcome for uh, three and two are at the same place. Mm -hmm. So that might indicate that um, you don't need all of those item categories. So it's it's a little different in a context like this because these are testlets. 
Mm -hmm. but you're not getting any nice distinction or space between scores of two and three there. That's for sure. So would, could that mean that um, it doesn't matter whether we ask math problems about the number three or the number four? Like they spawn the same way? Um, in that particular uh, content question, uh, yes. So, hmm. so either they get them both right or both wrong, or or they're kind of a chance for one of them. Yeah, there's not not anything distinct going on there. Okay. Right, and um, um, these plots are kind of uh, hard to interpret because. There's only four possible sum scores, so you don't really see a curve here, but it's it's kind of um, bumpy. And uh, if you had more items, usually you, you would have more than two items on a uh, uh, on a measure. Um, then then you'd have a, a more of a curve. All right. Whoa! Look at that. <laughs> What does that tell you? That's telling you that uh, um, the identity item has information and the match item isn't worth very much. And that corresponds to what we saw in that last plot in the, in the scores, if you go back a little bit. Oh, you mean the item map? Yeah. Okay. Oh, the match item. Yeah. Oh, I see. Nothing happening there. Hmm. So. so we get a lot more information from the identity item. It's wider, too. Exactly. Hmm. Interesting. It is. All right, and then we have the usual OpenMX summary here, and um, in this case, we do get the uh, CFI, TLI, and RMSCA because we estimated the, the reference model, the uh, independence and uh, saturated models. And those are also all very good values, so yeah, we like those. Yeah, the um, these two, the CFI and TLI, are kind of like R squared for regression. So you want them close to one, mm -hmm. and then the RMSEA, um, it's, it's good if that's less than uh, 0.05. Of course, the confidence interval here, since our we only have two items, and the I guess the sample size is kind of low, so we shouldn't have too much confidence in our fit. Um, the confidence interval is pretty wide. But that's that would be a good RMA. Right, and that wraps it up. Yeah. So please, uh, you know, try it out with your own data and see how it goes. Good luck.